So there's a drug on the market right now, an approved drug that does about $200 million a year called Latisse. Now, the origin story for Latisse is strange and both pretty typical for drug discovery. It was originally an ocular glaucoma drug uh, called Lumigan. Now, Lumigan, in clinical trials, doctors noticed that one of the side effects was that it caused patients to grow really thick eyelashes. And it was only slightly better than the existing ocular glaucoma drugs for treating that. So uh, Allergan did what in startups we would call a pivot, and now we have Latisse for extending eyelashes. This is a drug discovery success story. As some of you may know, this is similar to how Viagra was discovered, which was originally a chest pain and uh, heart disease medication, an indication for which it is sometimes still prescribed, leading to kind of awkward headlines. Now, a slightly less charitable way of looking at the situation is that Allergan got lucky in that all of their scientific excellence had really nothing to do with, um, with this excessive Latisse. Nothing in their preclinical models or the reasons for advancing Lumigan said anything about how they'd also corner the eyelash growth market. Um, I was talking to a senior informatics guy in the industry a little while ago about how I didn't feel like this was really a success the industry could take credit for, and his response was, on the contrary, I think that by not having an arrogance that we really understood nature, did we leave ourselves open to this collateral discovery, which is a really weird sentiment for a late development stage drug. It's like we wrote a piece of software to do spreadsheet modeling and noticed in acceptance testing that it was really more of a photo sharing app. On the other hand, if you've spent a lot of time in startups, you've probably seen something like that too through customer development, so I'm not really sure what the moral is, Bob, other than it's obviously not very good. Maybe it's that we can still kind of succeed and make a lot of money despite the fact that nobody really has any idea what they're doing. On that note, it's worth pointing out that nobody really understands how Latisse works. This is generally true of phenotypic screening. Uh, and it was true of, of things going back to, say, penicillin. Like, at the time we discovered penicillin, we had no idea how it worked, other than it was just really good at killing bacteria. And we didn't understand how it worked for a long time after that, too. In fact, we didn't even know its structure for 17 years. Even today, we know uh, true detailed mechanisms for very few approved drugs. And the ones that we do know about are typically very old drugs where we've had a literal generation to finally comb through things. I tried to find some more recent examples here. Um, Lumigan was approved in 2001, Viagra in 1998, penicillin before World War II. But another thing about drug discovery is that it takes an extremely long time. For high throughput screening, it's an average of 11 years between the screening hit being found and a drug being approved, with one outlier up there at 19 years. In fact, no drug found through high throughput screening since 2006 has been approved yet. So a big theme of this talk is that we spend right now today most of our time and money shuffling around, like, shuffling around resources in clinical trials. Um, and really, these are research problems. If the science was really that good, the clinical trials would be a formality. We should know the outcomes before we start them. This is how many other industries work. Um, but we don't know how to solve the research problems, and the levers aren't obvious. So what we do is we shuffle around money in development and dance around the problem. Um, there's probably only one big thing that, will, that we could do in development that would have a big impact here, which is going into humans earlier and more efficiently, since we have no other good models. But the bottom line is that this is really a research problem, not a development problem. So what drives biotech forward? Like, we have this myth of the genius scientist synthesizing knowledge and having these insights, but really I think it's all about tools. It's better tools that will allow us to better interrogate the biological systems, better understand the underlying mechanisms, better recreate and build on the work of others. Um, and that's really where, where the insights will come from. For some quick background on myself, Three years ago, I started a company called Transcriptic, which began with three simple observations. Basic research is overwhelmingly manual today, using pipetters and techniques that haven't really changed in 30 years. We communicate methods using Word documents over email and spend huge amounts of money on equipment that's fundamentally the same as everyone else's. In fact, the equipment is so expensive and so complex that it changes how scientists think about their field. If you usually use a technique like qPCR, um, and you'd like to use mass spec, you have to find a collaborator or someone to help you do it, but really you just wouldn't do that project because you're not thinking about what you can do with mass spec. So Transcriptic is a robotic cloud laboratory based in California where we have shipping container sized automated systems that customers use over the internet from all over the world to run their experiments on demand. <laughs> 
We virtualize the wet lab and allow scientists to focus on the ideas of their research and give them scale they've never had before. Um, we're used by several of the world's largest biopharma companies and academic labs all over the world. To make this work, there's a huge amount of hidden complexity. We've had to build a wide range of technologies and a really difficult part has been hiding a lot of that complexity from the customer. So there are two major points to this talk. The first is that drug discovery is in a crisis, and the second is that this is mostly due to a lack of sufficiently powerful tools. Drug discovery is a data problem. Now, if you're caught saying this out loud, one of the first things that will happen is that at least five people will remind you of our history with chemoinformatics and structure-based drug design and combinatorial chemistry and high-throughput screening as if like we've been there before and it's all lies. But let's take a contrarian view for a second and ask like, why were those projects underwhelming? Biology has advanced fantastically in the last 30 years, but the reality is that it still struggles with some basic, basic things today. Two senior scientists from Amgen published a study in Nature in 2012 where they tried to recreate 53 landmark cancer papers and were only able to validate six, which is 11% reproducibility of a set of papers that went on to generate over 10,000 uh, citations, a secondary literature of over 10,000 papers. One reason for this is that we don't know how to communicate experimental methods. There isn't nearly enough information in the method section of a paper to faithfully recreate what the authors did. Now, it's not that the biology is probably wrong, it's that there are very high frictions. So this means going back and forth over email, often having reagents mailed to you, talking to the other authors, and um, to really figure out what the, the other lab really did. Natural language is just a naturally poor way of expressing this information. Another big source of irreproducibility is the reagents are very sensitive. So if one lab runs, the, let's say that you get the, the steps all exactly right, you run the exact same experiment as somebody else, but you use physically different cells. So you think it's the same cell line, you, th you get all the steps right, but you might still get different results because you used a physically different sample of the cells than the other lab did, and biology is complicated, and we just don't know about enough about our reagents to know when reagents are equivalent or not. Um, so this kind of creates distress that we're just missing foundational technologies to do this really well. Um, but it raises the question, what is a well-designed assay? Like, the, an assay where we cannot, like, that, de that is sensitively dependent on differences in our, in our materials that we cannot regularly d detect is probably not a well-designed assay. We lack this control over experimental setups, reproducibility, and we lack easy access uh, to scale out auto scalable automation, we've historically lacked compute power. So there's a lot of disappointment today about the promise of big data and drug discovery, about how it hasn't paid off, but the reality is that we're not there yet. There are very few places in the world with the resources to scale up a large assay, and very few of those have a flexible infrastructure to do it for new complex things responsively to, to what the scientists want to do. The reality is, is that the only place where we actually have big data today is next-gen sequencing. And everywhere else, it's a mix of kind of small, incoherent data sets that don't add up to a bigger picture, which really frustrates learning from the data. Because we can't learn from the data, we have to rely on strong models. So this is things like everybody has seen an example of you run a reaction, it doesn't work, the scientist tweaks a rule of thumb that they have in their hand to try it again and iterate. This is a quintessential data optimization problem, but the problem is that there isn't enough information in the data to learn from it because you're missing all these other parameters that mean that you need to have a more complex model in your head. The information is just not there. So we treat biology as a big collection of facts to be learned, like what the pathways are, how, how the components interact, um, what receptors are overexpressed in some cancer. There's a lot of disappointment about the promise of would-be data here, but like I said, the, the problem is not that, that the computational methods are wrong, it's that the data is not in the data set. So we think about how do we, how do we gather that data. Um, related to this, our model organisms are all really bad. Like a big source of what, a uh, big source of what gets blamed for our 96% clinical trial failure rate is that the model organisms don't generalize well into humans. So you get something to work really well in a mouse or a monkey or a dog, and it's very convincing, and then it goes into humans and the drug fails. But forget that for a second. Imagine if we were mice, right? We'd be living in a golden age of medicine. We're in the middle of a mouse oncology renaissance right now. It's a great time to be a mouse and have cancer. So how did we get to this point? Um, the... <coughs> We're used to thinking about a risk-reward trade-off in terms of going into patients. And what I've seen is that uh, regulatory bodies want to do the best they possibly can for the patients, but they can't help but being pessimistically biased. 
like, this is an interesting insight where they're, they're graded on minimizing downside, not maximizing upside. So there's like, if you look at it, so a patient is sick, they come in, we are working on research. If we do nothing and the patient gets worse, no one will blame us. That's just the way nature was going before we got involved. But the do nothing option isn't really all that great. Like the patient continues to be sick and it degrades. So it's not really a risk benefit analysis that we have to do. We have to get comfortable with a risk risk analysis where there's two bad options and this should really change the calculus of how you think about going into humans earlier once you've done extensive safety testing very efficiently. But we have to think, I think a little bit differently about our models when you think about how do we get the data to learn from. One of the really promising uh, points is that there's been a huge range of breakthroughs in computer science over the last five years. So wh why should we have hope about uh, drug discovery? Um, and so this is, I'll build it up from, look at, there's lots of problems that we thought were totally intractable in the 90s, back when we were doing, back when Vertex was getting started and people were excited about that, um, that uh, were completely intractable that have recently fallen. So in the last five years, we went from not being able to transcribe uh, speech to text to being able to answer complex natural language questions about complex images. So uh, you can give a computer the image and the question underneath, and it will give you an English sentence with the answer. And the really crazy part is that the models that do well on visual question answering are more or less the same models that do really well on, text, on speech transcription. So there are, there are fundamental breakthroughs in the computer science that have really dramatically advanced that field, um, like around deep learning. So the billion dollar question here is, does this give us, do we believe that this is actually gonna have an impact in drug discovery? And so the, 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 the lesson there is that there were, historically, when you did machine learning, when you did data science, it was built on deep domain expertise for each of those problems. If you wanted to do uh, question answering, you'd have a complex natural language model which tagged parts of speech and tried to build up semantic trees, and now it's all just a neural network. And that's come to dominate more or less all of the machine learning benchmarks since 2012. And one of the benchmarks that it won was something called the Merck Molecular Activity Challenge, which is a model of um, binding affinity. So you want to know how, how tightly will your molecule bind to a target. And before 2012, this was won by a, uh, a molecular docking method that had been around since the late 90s. And then in 2012, a grad student at the University of Toronto who knew nothing about drug discovery, um, but knew a lot about reading data sets and building neural networks, won $40,000 from Merck for building a neural network uh, that learned this with no prior knowledge about the domain. So we have good reasons to believe that these breakthroughs that have revolutionized other industries will also generalize well into drug discovery, but it's dependent on having the data in your data sets to learn from. Now this is important because life sciences are full of optimization problems, and many of these we expect to be able to succeed at, because doing things like troubleshooting and debugging a protocol to highly express some protein or design an efficient cloning reaction are things that uh, human scientists do all the time. And we'd expect that, uh, therefore, algorithm, like we, have, we know that humans can do it, therefore we know it's possible, but it's still a really hard problem for, for uh, computers to do. So the key here is that you cannot learn, for, there's, there's a mathematical property called stationarity. And this is like what we think of as reproducibility. You need to be able to run the same experiment or variation on the experiment and get consistent data which, with consistent structure that you can learn from. Breakthrough drugs come from better science, but better science is not about hitting on some new target or some new pathway. Better science is about having better tools that allow you to more routinely interrogate new targets with a, as little new creativity as, as possible. These are tools, not specific findings, and what's holding us back here is the tool chain. Um, better analysis needs a uh, foundation of better integration, and on that, finer manipulation and finer detection. Better tools will allow us to treat our optimization problems as optimization problems. So when we look at reproducibility in our lab, the big, uh, one of the biggest levers here recently has been uh, something called acoustic liquid handling. So we, when you do contrived benchmarks, you can get really good performance for very tight error bounds, but the question is how does this look, like, how does liquid handling performance look when you're doing unknown samples all day long, day in and day out? And uh, humans can maybe do one plate, they can do like two plates, maybe five plates, but they definitely can't do 30 and they can, definitely can't do it in 384 wells. So this kind of rules out humans right away if you're gonna be trying to generate stationary data. Uh, the vast majority of the automation so far has been pipetting based, 
But then there's a, like a huge jump here where a co a two companies developed a way to use sound waves to transfer uh, 20 nanoliter droplets between samples. And it's just the data coming off an acoustic system and the data coming off any pipetting system is just incomparable. This is the type of advance that has really changed the way that we generate and think about our data sets in biology. Um, but it's insufficient to just have a device and put it on a bench and use it. Uh, this is kind of analogous to semiconductors. So in semiconductor manufacturing, what distinguishes the foundries is not the different, it's not having better devices. They're all using the same steppers and the same cameras and most of the same devices. It's how it's integrated and how it's put together and how it's QC'd. There's continuous calibration and continuous quality that you have to do in biology just to make sure that you're getting consistent data all the time, every time. Um, I know of one major biopharma company that had a really strong effect in a, in a screening lab, and they moved to a new building and the effect went away. Eventually, they traced it down to the presence of skylights and having some uh, protein in the cell that was light sensitive. When they blocked the skylight, they got the effect back. There's numerous confusions that have resulted from uh, Boston being so cold and lab papers coming out of Harvard and MIT in the winter that have had trouble being reproduced at southern, at southern labs until they figured out to control for uh, room temperature. So I, this is kind of a kind of a, like a jump, but I couldn't figure out how to really smoothly work this slide. But one of the things that I want the take home messages is that uh, pattern matching is a lazy approach to reasoning, and first principles is a much more efficient. That will tell you really where your limitations and where your strengths are. In technology driven businesses, the future looks nothing like today, and what uh, was intractable yesterday, it's very easy to assume that what was intractable yesterday is still impossible when really something could have changed. The tactical question to ask is what's different now? Um, Google uses a planning methodology called objectives and key results, which is designed to set uh, ambitious goals. And one of the examples that Google, Google managers talk to new employees about is this example of in the 1920s, Swiss, wa Swiss watchmaking was at the pinnacle of its achievements. They had miniaturized the assembly process, the escapement rotated at 40,000 times, 30,000 times per second, uh, per minute. Maybe they were gonna push this to 40,000 times per minute, but they weren't gonna push it to 200,000 times per minute, and that was where the limitations on their assembly came from. But it was all about how do we push this smaller, make this finer, make this faster. And then the Japanese came out with a $2 quartz crystal that oscillated at 30,000 times per second. And that type of thinking, like going back to basics and being forced to abandon uh, your normal way of solving a problem because it would never get you there. That's the type of reasoning that gets you, that the type of chains of logic that get you acoustic liquid handlers from pipetters. If you just try and improve the, the syringe pumps or scale down the working volumes, and it's never going to get you there. So there's a huge amount of opportunity in biotech right now, but I think that a lot of it is, like, a lot of it is misguided. There's a lot of people that are working on um, looking for the new, the new targets, the new pathways, trying to do larger screens, but really what's holding us back is tools. And I think this is good news, especially for most people in this room, because tools are a lot more, like a lot easier to make reliable progress on. Um, there's, we need to scale down volumes, we need uh, greater bandwidths in our optics, we need, uh, there's more machine learning, there's better databases, there's better communication of methods, there's better validation. One of the projects that I think about all the time is, you could imagine having an autonomous uh, fuzzing system where you give a protocol and then it tells you what it's sensitive to. Like you have a five minute delay here, you have a 10 microliter volume here. Well, okay, go run variants of this and tell me what it's sensitive on. There's lots of in innovation there uh, which is waiting to happen, but it's not on looking at the specific biology. Um, yeah, so that's my point. Well, thank you, Max. Uh, I think we're all good to sleep smarter tonight. So, uh, anyone has a question? Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, I have two, um, my name is Guillaume. I have two major problems in my life. I don't say only two, but two major. The first one is I'm a doctor, and the second one is I'm French. But um, it's okay, I'm coping with that. Uh, I really appreciated your talk, uh, especially uh, dwelling on the tools you need. And you said something about the clinical trials that cannot be predictable. And I think as doctors, we can help you understand why they are not. And that's, I'm joining the, the talk of uh, Cecile Monte this morning. The, they are not predictable because we know from clinical experience that 
uh, several patients with the same medical data will not have the same results for the same treatment. Uh, and that is our main problem as doctors, is that this, this answer to treatment is not predictable. So I think that the tools we need as doctors, and we need them from you, yeah. is help us predict this variability because as for now, the only tools we have for this is doctors. And we are limited, and we are not always the most disruptive minds. Yeah, I mean, so it was, uh, one of the big problems with clinical trials is that you give the same treatment to patients that have the same clinical record and they have different outcomes, why? Like, this is a great example of, of, the, power, of the importance of tools, where it's, this is important to understand things like the molecular mechanisms. And so this is one of, like, the, one of the examples I'd use here is in genomics and DNA sequencing. So there, this is the, the wave of precision medicine right now, understanding like what are the molecular markers that you're going to use to indicate a treatment rather than just looking at like, like phenotypic signs and symptoms. Um, and one of, the prompt, one of the high points is that there is good evidence that when you have a better mechanism and when you have better molecular targeting for the patients, you'll get better outcomes. Like the example that's coming to mind is um, there's a, a study that was done in 2002, actually started here in France, um, where they found patients that had this rare disease, they sequenced them, they were able to trace a causative mechanism for the disease from the DNA sequencing. They were able to find a drug that bound to the target, that, uh, the target was called PCSK9, and then the story of that becoming, those becoming approved drugs and those becoming effective therapeutics was one of the fastest approval stories in like recent history because it started from a better tool that allowed you to segment the patient population, understand what was the, base, the molecular basis of the disease, um, and this depended on sequencing. This was not a matter of um, like looking at the patients or looking at the clinical records but without the tool. Yeah, one, one question here. Thank you for the amazing presentation and congratulations for your company. And if we try to reframe the problem, um, today there is only one debate about drugs. Is It's their price. All the time we, we yeah. hear about the price of drugs. And even if we know that it is not only totally true, we know that company, uh, um, in the, uh, pharmaceutical industry justify the high prices of drugs through their cost, which is not totally true, but at least it is uh, partly true. And the best potential I see for your company is not only to increase the approval rate of medicine per year, but also, of course, to lower their cost. Do you have the same vision? And in what timeline do you see that you might be able, through your companies or other of the same type, to lower the cost of R&D for a given drug? Yeah, so that's a very complicated question. And so obviously healthcare are not efficient economic markets by any means. I think that it has to come from better science. Like when you have better, better tools, this will drive better science, this will drive competition, uh, this will create efficiencies. I think that there are very high costs, and the costs aren't for the individual drugs, but the amortized over the failure rates, um, which is the, the all-in cost for the drug companies. Um, it's, like the way that I think about it right now is, imagine if it cost a billion dollars to make a video game. Like you just, you just wouldn't make it, right? Because you couldn't, because the patients couldn't, because the gamers couldn't afford it. And right now it costs us a billion dollars to make the video game. And this somehow works because there's lots of indirection how it's paid for and we can externalize the costs onto this other, onto this other population because we as a society have decided that this is valuable even though it's very difficult. Um, so I think that lo lower costs has to come from better science. Okay. Well, thank you, Max.